aware of that. Okay? So what I'd like to talk a little bit about today is, um, and we talked about physiology somewhat, that, that you can classify weeds based on, and there's some nice information in, the, in your class notes. I'm not going to go through all the details because I think it's pretty self-explanatory. But C3, C4 camp plants, we talked about how the C4s tend to be more efficient because of a couple of um, processes that they carry out and the kind of, um, in this case, uh, enzyme system that they use. Okay? If your plant physiology, or at least the basic plant phys is, yeah, geez, I don't remember C3, C4 that well, just hit any intro plant physiology book under photosynthesis and just kind of brush up on that. I will not ask you to draw the Krebs cycle or any of that, but it's helpful if you understand that there are going to be some C3, C4 plants. Which ones? I have a nice list in your handout of typical C3 weeds and crops and C4 weeds and crops. Okay? And again, why that might become important is this whole idea of climate change and CO2 levels rising. And if you understand what that means for C3 versus C4s, it might give you some insight into what is the wheat flora going to look like maybe in 30, 40 years. Again, if CO2 levels increase. Keep in mind that it's more complicated than that. It's not just the CO2 levels that are rising, but you've got more UV, you've got warmer temperatures, and all that impacts okay, the weeds. But that is another way that we can classify weeds. Okay? A third, another way that I, and what I want to spend time here is um, plant survival strategies. Okay? So you can, okay, um, basically, you can classify weeds based on how they attempt to survive, okay? Now, how many of you have seen this in other courses? Can you just kind of give me a sense? Don't, don't. If this is new to you, you have never. Uh, this is referred to R and K selection. These are two strategies um, that um, basically in the early 60s, um, MacArthur, uh, an ecologist was able to classify, and this doesn't include just plants, but also animals, based on how quickly they reproduce and where they invest their, their energies. Okay? And so what you, you typically get is you could, and these were, uh, so you can have a population, this is time, number of organisms, that's N, okay? So if you have a population that with time it just basically exponentially exponentially grows. This is also referred to as a geometric increase in the population. Okay? This would be the case where something is just doubling, tripling as time goes on really fast. And basically it's unlimited growth. Okay? And that is defined, so what will determine how steep this curve is, the geometric increase in the population? This is the change in number over the change in time. So as time goes on, the number here of organisms changes. What is it based on? It's based on the number of individuals that you start with, but something called the int intrinsic rate of increase. How fast does the population increase? I.e., for human beings, it's usually nine months. You know, you're not going to have the, you know, you need a nine-month gestation period. For, for elephants and, and whales, you know, it's, it's fairly lengthy. For a weed, you might have, or for, uh, you know, Drosophila flies, you're talking a couple of days where the population can double and triple just because that's an inherent in each of the organisms, whether animal, plants. So this is, this is universal, okay? And so that is often referred to as, you know, R, the in intrinsic rate of growth over N, okay? Or inherent rate of increase, okay? Now, let's think about this. Does a population increase indefinitely or unlimited, is unlimited in the growth. Do we, do we see this kind of go on forever in, on the planet? What happens? What's going to happen? Population reaches some form of carrying capacity. And what would you say is, what is carrying capacity? It can support. So, you know, what is the total, based on the resources available, you know, how, what is, um, what is the population size that the, that unit area can support? That is the key question right now globally. You know, how many people can this planet hold? What is the carrying capacity of the planet? Sooner or later, you know, 8 billion, is it going to be 9 billion? It's going to level off. This happens in plants and animals all the time, okay? So, you, you know, we have a major white, you know, tailed, or, or white-tailed deer problem. 
there's a certain capacity. After a while, it really gets problematic. Everything gets browsed. Sooner or later, the population is going to plateau. There's going to be a limit. And this is referred to as logistic increase. It increases steeply at first, almost exponentially or geometrically, and then reaches K, which is referred to as the carrying capacity, the limit of the habitat. Okay? So in this classroom, we can maybe, I don't know how many folks we can squeeze in, but there's a limit. After that, I mean, somebody's going to go. Okay? This happens, and this is going to be important for plants when we cover what's referred to as self-thinning in plants. Does anybody know or has ever heard of something called self-thinning? The self-thinning rule in plant populations. Any idea what that might be? So related to carrying capacity. Will die off. That's it. That's exactly what happens. It's kind of a scary thought when you think about altruism and you know helping the the you know the less less fortunate. But in plant populations, if you have a monoculture of plants at a given density, and I'll show you this over time, there will be, and and this is what we're trying to figure out: which ones are the ones that are going to survive? We know that yes, the, the 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 strongest and so forth. But what determines that? But there will be a decrease in the density. The plant population will self thin. And why is it doing that? Why will individuals die in a pot? So I start out with 100 ragweed plants, and I, I'm telling you that after about eight, nine weeks in a very close, you know, tight, yeah, flat, say, um, you're going to, you know, maybe 30 or 40 of them are going to die. What is in terms of selective pressure and the selective advantage of doing that? Why would a plant do that? Why would individuals in that population start dying off? Limited resources, but what is it trying to do? What's the ultimate goal of most plants, animals, living things? Reproduce and leave some, I mean, in, in its barest form, that's what survival of the fittest is. So that population, in a sense, is sacrificing individuals to leave a few, enough resources to be able to make it through to the next generation. And we'll talk about that, okay? And this, and you'll see, because this is tightly linked with this logistic increase, okay? So why am I showing you, and often, okay, the reason why we divide plants or animals as R-selected and K-selected is referring to the R, okay, for the geometric type increase. Those are the R-selected species. Those are species, whether they're animals or plants, that invest a lot of energy into reproduction. Fast growth, okay, quick reproduction, okay, they're not in there for the long term, okay? And so those are referred to as R-selected species. K-selected species are those that kind of initially increase fairly rapidly, but then basically over time, it's much more gradual growth and reproduction, okay? They're in it for the long term, and those are referred, because they're, they reach the carrying capacity, they're referred to as K-selected species, okay? One thing you've got to keep in mind is that this is a continuum. You don't just have R and K. There are species that are going to be in, and they behave sometimes as R, and they're kind of in, in this continuum. So don't get the idea, okay, ragweed, R selected. You know, elephants, K selected. Oak trees, K selected, because it takes them six years to grow, and then they're there for many years, okay? Or a cow, or you name it, okay? It is a continuum. But generally speaking, would you think that annual weeds, okay, would, the ones we find in annual cropping systems, do they tend to resemble more R-selected species or K-selected species? What would you say in general? Annual, annual weeds. R-selected. They're the guys that, that's why you get lamb squatters and pigweed, you know, a couple of hundred thousand seeds, okay, reproductive units per plant in three months. It's that quick turnover, very, very quick. Um, now, if these plants would grow, they would eventually reach the carrying capacity as well, but in general, one can say that, that annual weeds tend to follow or, or at least closely resemble what we call our selected species, this really fast growth, and that's why there's such a problem in agriculture, okay? Doesn't mean that longer, you know, K-selected species aren't a problem either. They're in there for the long term. They tend to be trees, okay? Uh, like I said, oak trees, maple trees. They may not begin reproducing until about the fourth, fifth year, but they could be there 200, 300 years. They're in there for the long term. They invest maybe little in the reproduction initially, they, they invest in growth, comp, you know, to be competitive. Whereas annuals, the R selected species, their advantage is quick reproduction and a lot of it, okay? So 
This is what, so if ever you hear R and K selective speed, what is that? As a, it's a way of uh, classifying, in this case, weeds, okay, based on reproductive output and where they invest resources, okay? Uh, we do have some weeds that resemble sometimes a little more decay selected. Again, it's not one or the other. They tend to be in, in between. But if I, you know, if I had to say which one they're closest to, definitely the R selected. Okay? Everybody kind of get the gist? I mean, I'm not going to ask you to start drawing it, but just get the idea. So exponential and geometric growth are synonyms. So if you hear exponential growth or geometric, they're the same thing. Okay? Whereas logistic growth, this is the typical curve. It kind of basically asymptotes, flattens out. Okay, and basically cannot go over the carrying capacity. There's just no way. Okay, and what actually happens is, uh, in this case, is that that uh, as plants die off in a population, they leave more resources for the remaining individuals, the survivors, and they keep growing. They reach the carrying capacity. A few more die. Okay, till eventually there's just a few of them, but they they produce lots of seeds. It's a way for the population to to contribute to make sure that that it survives from one generation to the next, okay? So, okay, so this is just explaining this. And you have this in your notes, not exactly in this form, but just recognize this. They tend to have a growth curve which fits most closely with the geometric, okay, especially at early stages of growth. That's our annual weeds. That's why there's such a problem. You've got to get them before they, they said, you know. Uh, and they tend to develop a, a final population significantly less than the carrying capacity. Okay, they don't really reach it because they grow in two, three, okay, two, three months, they, they, you've got the seeds, they're in, they're out, because you're going to be tilling, and so they've been selected for it. They can't sit there for three years because you're going to come with a cultivator or a herbicide and knock them off. So you've selected for plants that can get in there quick and out fast, okay? Whereas if you're in a no-till or a pasture, you could be there three, four years, okay? So that's it. Case strategists tend to be have slower initial growth, they're in it for the long run. This is a marathon, okay? This is the 100 meter dash, okay? This is basically, you're in for a marathon. So you're, gonna, you're not gonna be sprinting out like you know, you're running 100 meters or something. You're gonna be take, you know, pacing yourself. That's what these plants do, okay? Animals the same way, okay? So it's just strategies and stuff. And certainly their population tends to reach carrying capacity, at least theoretically. Okay, but that's, I, I like the analogy of kind of the, the quick, you know, 100 meters versus marathon. And so you kind of think of the strategy that this plant, uh, you better save some energy for later on, not, not put it all out at once. Okay, and the other, as I use the other analogy is the hare and the tortoise. You know, remember, just, just keep that in mind. I, I, these are kind of things I like to keep in mind. Sometimes, you know, you, things get complicated and it's easier. Okay. All of this is related to what we call resource allocation. Where does the plant, the energy it's going to make, where does it invest it? Does it put it in roots? Does it put it in you know, reproductive structures? And you should be thinking about that. And I told you most annual weeds will put it into reproduction. And, okay, so resource allocation. And what's plasticity? What's plasticity of plants in this case? If somebody says, ooh, that's a very plastic plant. Does it mean it's kind of plastic rubber there? Okay, so the ability of the plant phenotypically, you actually see it. And the example I've always used was velvet leaf, that in corn it could be 14 feet high, but in soybeans it'll be four or five feet high, just enough to overtop the soybeans. Remember we saw this in the, uh, in the lab, Stephanie's field, where you, you saw the velvet leaf lose all its bottom leaves, just have kind of a little umbrella parachute look to it. That's it, in corn it'll do that, just this big stem, but make sure it's got its, its leaves up there, okay? So... Let's think about, okay? So plants have evolved adaptations to different niches, to different, okay, environments that they try to maximize growth, okay? So one specific adaptation, okay, is basically how these plants budget resources. And not all plants do the same. We all know that. Some plants put a lot of energy below ground. Others put it above ground. Others put it in reproduction. So how is, can we make sense of that? But basically, how these different plants allocate budget or energy or resources is referred to as resource allocation. Okay? So I'll often ask you, I'll say, uh, geez, I wonder what, or people ask, what's the allocation, resource allocation pattern in this plant? I.e., is it pumping all that biomass below ground? A good example is a plant that I'm working with. 
an invasive vine called swallowwort that some of you know about or have heard about. You look at this plant when it's seedlings, one or two years old, the seedling above ground is about this size. You look below ground, this thing's got a root like this size. It's basically almost a four to one, five to one ratio, more biomass. Into, so in this plant, the resource allocation pattern is way more biased towards okay, the roots. And we, we'll, we'll talk about, so what does that mean? Who cares if it's got a more in the roots? Well, if you're managing this plant, you better start thinking about that. Because you could say, oh, I'm going to mow the top of it. Well, yeah, you mow the top, but guess what it's got under? Just like Japanese knotweed or wild bamboo. It's got major, major below ground. So you're going to be mowing for a long time, or even if you're going to put a systemic herbicide. So knowing the resource allocation pattern of a plant is extremely important. Okay? Know your enemy before you attack. That's, always, that's the way it is if you kind of treat weeds as enemies in this situation. Okay? So our, our strategies put a lot of energy, early growth and early reproduction. I mean, think of our classic annual weeds. They're all in that group. I mean, how many plants? 200,000 seeds in three months. You know, you go now, you should see the foxtails are all, you know, dispersing seeds, lamb squares, anything that's made it out, pig weeds, it's bad news. I mean, if you haven't controlled them by now, it's just they're going in there. Okay? So, uh, and, and overall, resources are primarily to high short-term productivity. Okay? Whereas the case selected, they're in it for sustained growth. They're put it into biomass, above ground, below ground, trunk, you name it. Okay? So long-term survival and efficiency, that's what they're in for. They're not into this uh, you know, rapid growth and reproduction efficiency. Okay? That's, that's basically what that's saying. Uh, and so again, we talked about plasticity, this adaptation to change in the environment. Plants can do that. Okay? You've all seen plants. Have you ever gone under an, a maple tree? I don't know. Some of you guys maybe do that. You know, you kind of dream. You're sitting under there. Do you ever notice the leaves on the inside of a maple, sugar maple, you name it, versus the outer leaves? Do you ever notice what they look like? Does anybody? Could you tell me in terms of morphology what they would look like if they're... The ones that are inside, they're shaded. They tend to be really big and very thin. That's a classic, okay, shade adaptation of most plants. Okay? The outer ones are what? They're, they're basically very thick, cuticle, you know, very thick, very hard, you know, almost hard. I mean, they're almost behaving like you're during the desert because they're getting hit by sunlight. That's in many ways, and if you would take that, what we call sun plant, you know, leaf, and you would, if you were able to do that and put it in, in shape, over time it would, it would change its form to adapt to that. So that is referred to as plasticity of plants. It's, it's determined by genetics, obviously, how wide the range is, but it's really a response to the environment, okay? So very, very important. Plants are a classic of doing this. I mean, that's why they, they can be a problem, okay? So the R strategist, the weeds, annual weeds, they're a classic. They show, I mean, I've worked with these plants, and you go, is that the same plant? I can't believe it. It looks like that on a roadside. And I go into a field, and I've got lamb squatters, you know, 10 feet high. Whereas on, you know, roadside, even if it hadn't been mowed because it's a, you know, very stressed environment, it's this size. It's unbelievable, the, okay? But generally, the case strategists, you don't see that. You know, an oak tree is not going to vary that much. This is going to be, yeah, it might, if it's in a yard by itself, it'll be that, you know, kind of broad versus, you know, kind of tall and spindly, but not, it, the degree is just not as, as high, okay? So, resource allocation, plasticity, keep that in mind when you're talking about weeds. Okay, so a couple of things to think about: our selected species, case selected species. I don't. Ha I'm not going to go through all of this. Okay, our selected species in terms of mortality. Okay, often catastrophic mortality happens. This is that whole idea of self thinning. These plants are growing so fast. Okay, even though they're not reaching eventually um, carrying capacity, you tend to get death early on. Seedlings, a lot of them die early. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's, it's usually at an early age and it's, um, okay, whereas you, you, in say oak trees and more long-lived species, mortality occurs throughout the growth of the plant. You might have some early, some middle-aged, some older, obviously a few more, okay? Um, lifespan short, usually less than one year, okay? These are just some of the characters. For case-selected species, long, usually more than one year and way beyond that in many species, okay? Yes, me. In regards to survival, case of survival like that, yes. do plants spin themselves out because there aren't enough resources, or is that like a communication within the species of the plant? I don't know how that would work. 
Yeah, in this case, what happens is that um, they basically are producing a lot of seeds knowing that there's going to be some mortality occurring. Some of it is just inherent mortality. It's basically, you think about, I'm trying to think of, you know, an animal that, you know, insects that we, you know, just put out. They know, you know, Japanese beetles, a certain number are going to get wiped out, and so they're going to flood. So part of it is inherent, but part is that they, even though they say, well, it doesn't really reach carrying capacity, they can really quickly. If you've got crops in there, and you've got, you know, a thousand seedlings per meter square or per square foot, um, some of it is this cell thinning that's going to occur. So there's going to be a crash of the population to leave a few of them survive. Okay, so I would say that it's, it's, it's a two-pronged, that there is more self-thinning occurring, even, and, and, you know, the argument there as well, uh, you would mention that they don't really reach carrying capacity in many ways, and because that was generalized, but for weeds, they do. They actually, that's why it's a problem in cropping systems, because they're going to be taking away the nutrients that you're thinking, these are going to go to my crop or to your, you know, native species if you're working in natural areas. The, you know, the invasive or the weeds are going to take those nutrients. And we know that they're faster growing. We know that they have more rapid growth. And so that's, that's going to be one thing. You're going to get the self-thinning because they will reach that carrying capacity fairly quickly. Okay? But also inherent is that you get some mortality in that population just occurring, inherent with some of the weed populations, even when they're not at the highest densities, which is, and again, why that happens, we don't know. But it does happen. Okay? So... Um, if you would look at survival curves, you would see, you say, wow, a lot of seedlings dying off here. I wonder why. This is partly is self-thinning, partly is inherent in these plants. They, it's kind of the, it's, it's uh, included in the package that they're going to lose some, some individuals. Okay? Overall result is that our selected species focus on productivity. Get a lot of seeds in there, in the ground, reproduction. Whereas K-selected species, it's efficiency. Again. You think about a 100, you know, meter dash, you know, you're in there for, you know, get there fast, as fast as you can, beat efficiency. A, a marathon runner is going to pace themselves. They're going to be in there for the long term, okay? Again, just be familiar with some of these. Don't, and again, not all apply to weeds and so forth, but I just wanted you to be aware of when we talk about what are some of the traits of our, in case like, and again, remember, these are not limited to plants or weeds. It's the same in the animal. If you take an animal ecology course, you probably will cover this as well because we do have that. Okay? Uh, so what strategy do weeds tend to display, if I were to ask you, in terms of R&K selected? Okay. Uh, which weeds are the most extreme R strategists? Yes. Yeah, annual weeds, and again, I'm just, you know, kind of making it, that's exactly what we're likely to see, you know, the annual weeds, because weeds, we have, you know, perennials and so forth, but the annual weeds are the classic in terms of the extreme, okay? Short-lived annuals, okay? Common ground zone, these are what we call ephemerals, chickweed. They're in there, like I say, three months and they're out, okay? Things like Gallinsoga can reproduce in, in the Ithaca area three times in a growing season, okay? Three cycles, seeds go in, okay, plant germinates in the spring, produces seeds. Those same seeds, some of them will germinate, produce another crop of seeds, goes into the ground, and if, they, we, if, if we don't get a really hard frost into kind of mid-October, and sometimes later, it can have a third. So, I mean, that's, for this part of the world, that is really uncommon, okay? That would be an extreme R strategist as well for me, okay? Which weeds are, are the best case strategists, okay? Simple herbaceous perennials and woody perennials. Kind of generally speaking, you know, wild cherries, box elder, or Manitoba maple, the eastern agundo, you know, the, the maple that's got the five leaflets you always see growing, that's considered weedy. It's, it's a pain for a lot of folks to see that, that plant, okay? But this, again, is, is, you know, we can't classify them all in, that, in that, that way. Now, has anybody seen this kind of a diagram before? Doesn't have to be related to plants. Who's seen this? Soil texture. Remember sand, clay? I mean, this is all coming back. Well, a fellow named Philip Grime from England, an ecologist, okay, in the late 70s, basically said, I need to take this r &K selected strategy a, a little further. There's more to plants than just that there are r and K in this continuum. And he basically looked at many plants in many ecosystems and said, you know what? You can actually... Divide up plants, just like we do, you know, for, for silt, sand, clay. 
we can do that. He said, you know, you look at plants and how you can actually differentiate them based on if there's, they tolerate stress, okay, stress tolerators. Those are the S, okay, the S part. Um, some plants, man, they're really competitive. I would say these are, you know, some are, are, are in, a, in a given area because they, they can tolerate the area. I.e., some plants grow in, in heavily contaminated areas, high metal content. Uh, most plants can't handle, but there's a few that can't. Those are stress tolerators. Some can handle Arctic conditions or desert conditions. They're stress tolerators. Most plants can't do it. So he, that's what got him thinking. And then you had some plants really competitive. We tend to find those in our ag fields, very fertile. And he referred to those plants as competitive strategists, stress tolerant strategists, okay? And then rural strategists, those are those plants that uh, basically actually uh, favor disturbance. They're favored by the more disturbance you have in a habitat, these plants move in, which would be classically would be our annual weeds. I mean, what better rural strategists than our annual weeds where we're tilling the land, plowing, chisel plowing, you know, go in, harrowing, and then we disturb the soil, boom, these plants are there. And he referred to those plants as being rural strategists, okay? And he basically said, well, you know, it's not just one or the other. Some of these, some of these species might be like we have in some of our soils. They could be a combination of uh, sand, silt, clay, in various combinations. It's not easy, you know, to just categorize some, some species saying, oh, they're competitive, those are rurals, those are stress tolerant. But that they're probably a combination thereof. And he came you know, with this idealized sketch that resembles, again, soil texture, okay, diagram that you've seen, where, and again, you could have species that could be stress-tolerant ruderals, i.e., they can handle stress, but they also could be ruderals. They can handle a bit of disturbance, okay? Uh, obviously, if you're just at one end, one corner, these are the stress tolerators, okay? These are the disturbance tolerators, those that can handle disturbance and these are the competitors and you could go up the each side of the scale and find out well if you're 75 percent competitive you know kind of idealized and 25 percent stress tolerant where would you be and you'd say well I'd end up in this kind of category here a CR and so forth again it's idealized what they try to do is try to think about some plants where would they fit or at least some plants in various ecosystems okay but again this is referred to as CSR strategy, okay, plant strategy, CSR, from Philip Grime, who was an ecologist, okay, from England, okay. The way I like to look at this in a very simple way is to plot level of stress and uh, on, the, on this axis here, and level of stress could be, you know, water stress if you're in the desert, it could be temperature if you're in the Arctic or Antarctica, okay, you name it. it this is, again, theoretical. And level of disturbance, low disturbance, i.e., we're not plowing up the field every three months or every six months, okay, uh, versus very high, you know, just basically our annual cropping systems. Based on this, okay, schematic then, what kind of strategy would be favored, okay? So let's look at this. If you would be in a low-stress area, i.e., you've got lots of water, lots of nutrients, Nothing's really limiting you, and you have low disturbance. Nobody's going to break you up or till you up, you know, in three months. What kind of species would be favored there? What kind of plant? What kind of plant strategy would be favored there? You would probably be thinking competitors, those that can handle competition. They're very good. They're not going to be disturbed every two months, and they have enough nutrients, and they can grow fast and, and, and large, okay? So we would definitely favor the C or the competitors here. Now, let's say we have low stress, but we have high disturbance, okay? Low stress, high disturbance, what would we favor? Well, what would be a situation where you have low stress and high disturbance? Can you tell me of an uh, ag-related system that would represent this? Low stress, high disturbance. If I were to ask you on a prelim, Steve, uh, but let's say what kind of system? cropping system would you be dealing with here? Would I be dealing with, uh, say, no-till for 10 years? Would I be dealing with, um, you know, 
intensive vegetable production, annual crops, corn, soybeans, where you're going in, low stress in the sense that you're going to have plenty of nutrients. Ho hopefully, you're, you're going to be providing some nutrients, whether organic, inorganic. There should be, hopefully, enough water if you're irrigating, cropping, you know, vegetable crops. Some of them are in three, two months. They're out. You put another crop. But they're high disturbance. So that's, ruderals are really what we call our annual weeds. That would be the situation, okay? Now, if we have high stress, i.e., we're, you know, we don't have lots of water. We're in the desert. And we don't have much disturbance. Who's going to handle that situation? The stress tolerators. Those plants, you know, the cacti, if you're in the desert. Or the low shrubs up in the Arctic, okay? Uh, lichen and so forth. Now, what happens in a situation where you have, and again, this is relative, high disturbance, i.e., every two seconds, somebody's tilling you up, okay? And you have high stress, not many nutrients, not much water, okay? Those are not good conditions for plant growth, okay, in the extreme. You're not going to have much there, okay? So, for example, if, uh, you know, new subdivision's going up, okay, and, uh, you know, it's a, and, and it's really poor soil, the sub, you know, topsoil has been removed, subsoil is really bad news, and every five days you're, you know, tilling or you're plowing up the place, you're not going to have any plants. They just don't have time to grow. So those are not the environment. So what's closest to our ag-type systems? Right here. These guys. Rurals, basically high disturbance because of our tillage, annual cropping systems or vegetables, and competitors. Because even, you know, in an alfalfa field that's there for two, three years, fertility is good, low stress, okay, and low disturbance, i.e., we're not tilling up our alfalfa field every We're mowing. But we're not going to be plowing it up every second year or every year unless, you, you know, your establishment is really poor. Okay? So most of our weeds tend to be C or R, a combination of thereof. Very few of our annual weeds or, or in, in ag systems tend to be stress tolerators. I'm not saying they're not, but, okay, why is that? Why in our typical ag systems, we, you know, most of our weeds are not really stress. We think they are, but they're not. Yeah, we don't, I mean, we're, we're watering, especially of our vegetable crops, it's ir irrigated. I mean, I was in Delaware, 100% of their crop, of their vegetables are irrigated. 50% uh, of their corn is irrigated. We don't have much of our corn here irrigated, but down south it is, and out west. So you're not, a, you know, there's hopefully not going to be any stress, okay? So, so those are the kind of situations, okay? And, and we talk about, so one way you could categorize plants, and in weeds, in this case, is based on their level of the level of disturbance of the habitat and the nutrients, nutrient availability or water availability. Okay, we basically pamper our crops. As much as you think we don't, we do. Okay, and we got weeds that are you know have been selected to just love those conditions. That's why a lot of them mimic your crop. Okay, and we're going to talk about that. So keep that in mind when we we talk about this. And Without going into detail, like I said, they try to categorize, you know, so if you're in this end here, um, ecosystems tend to be competitive. Here they tend to be those species that like disturbance, and species down here, okay, tend to be stress tolerated. Just to give you an example, uh, annual herbs, okay, uh, these are annual herbs. Um, they tend to be in, in low stress, high disturbance environments. So, the arrow indicates going from high to low. So, you know, just look at the various communities. So, for example, I want to show you uh, E, lichen. Okay? Where do lichen grow? Has anybody been up north or in Alaska, Yukon? Where do lichen grow? Rocks. On rocks. They grow in the subarctic. When I, I was working in the northern Quebec, about 58 degrees north, uh, you're above the tree line. Has anybody been up in those areas? Can, you gotta, you, you, if you get a chance, go up in the Ar you know, subarctic and so forth. I mean, you basically, the trees end. There's no trees. You might see some black spruce about this size, and the side where the winds are prevailing, the northwest, that's usually prevailing winds, where I was in the north, there's basically no branches. You just have them on one side, kind of the leeward side, where they're protected somewhat. The rest, so you've got black, stunted black spruce with uh, basically stunted uh, birch, Okay, and then in between is this carpet of lichen. Okay, just carpets. It's just white all over the place. Okay, and I, I may have told you that. Well, maybe not. When I was up there, I was an undergrad, and there were there's some NASA scientists working up there, and 
they were looking, doing satellite imagery and so forth, looking at disturbance. They were doing a bunch of things. But one of the uh, researchers there was telling me that each time we, and we'd go, I was working on insects at the time, you know, uh, horse flies and so forth. Every time I stepped on one of those lichen, it would take 50 to 75 years to, to grow back because you kind of just squanched them. That is a very stressful environment, okay? And so E then, uh, lichen tend to be S, very high stress, okay, low competition, i.e. there's no other game in town. They're it, and they're, you know, they're, gonna, they're there because they can handle the conditions. They're not the best conditions. These plants are in it for the long run. They don't produce very much. They just survive, but they get by, okay? That's kind of their niche. That's their niche. You throw them in an old field, forget it. They're just not going to be on. We got, they're going to be competed out. Now, of course, the concern is what happens with climate change, to, and we're seeing a northward migration of some species that are typical of, of, of temperate areas moving. Just same for birds, insects, and so a lot of you are going to be facing that or dealing. How do we deal with? Well, how's that going to change the whole, um, you know, scheme? So this is just to show you that you can you know, group, you know, organisms. Again, you can't do it specific. I won't ask you. Uh, is ragweed? Uh, Point, put the dot of ragweed on this, on this schematic, but at least give me an idea that this tends to be probably a rural, high disturbance type adapted species. It can be very competitive too. The more fertility, the better those plants grow. That's why they grow to this size. Okay? And I, this is just building on this. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go on this. Okay? So what I want to just quickly just mention to you is the stress tolerators. They put all their energy, their resources to maintenance and survival. That's the lichens. They just got to make it through winter, one winter after another winter. I mean, they're not there that I'm going to produce 10,000, 200,000 seeds or, okay. They are just barely making it. But nothing else can make it there, so they're going to they're gonna do okay, okay. Competitors. The competitors maximize resources in productive but relatively undisturbed environments. These would be our grasslands. You know, when we... Abandon a field after cultivation. The first few years we have annual weeds, our annual herbaceous plants. What happens in year five and six? You tend to get grasses. The poas get in there, the goldenrods. Okay, those plants tend to be very competitive and they can handle fertile. They, they actually do best if the soil is fertile, which it is often after abandonment. Okay, but they don't, goldenrod doesn't like it when you go in every second year and, and cultivate. So that's where this that's where those plants come in. And that's why in alfalfa fields, after about four years of growing straight alfalfa, what happens? We get some perennials that are giving a, you know, a hard time. We get the asters. We get things like uh, horse nettle, perennials that are fairly competitive but don't like to be disturbed frequently. That's why we've got to till it under after four or five years. You know, productivity goes down, but our weed be weeds become a problem. And we now have to, you know, renovate our alfalfa, put it in corn, or move on, rotate, okay? But what happens in the year of establishment? What kind of weeds come up in our alfalfa in our year of establishment? Tend to be annual weeds in general and biannuals, okay? So, and ruderals, these are our annual weeds. Maximize capture of resources in highly productive environments in our cropping system. We fertilize, we, you know, provide water in vegetable cropping systems. Man, this is like a perfect world for those guys. They're fast growing. They reproduce fast. They take up nutrients faster than our crops do. That's why it's such a challenge to manage weeds. Okay? So, and remember that rurals are pioneers of secondary succession. Okay? Do you guys know what the difference between primary succession and secondary succession is? Remember plant ecology or basic ecology? What's primary succession of plant communities? Can you give an example where? So let's say there's a forest fire, the first plants that grow up that year part of the primary. Right. So a forest fire, or if you have a volcano eruption, the first plants to move in, that's kind of basically the plants are starting from scratch. They're, they're, they're setting up shop on those soils that, you know, yeah, there might have been plants before, but that the volcanic soil did not have plants before him. Those will be the first plants. Secondary succession is where we have vegetation, we disturb it by tillage, for example, and now we've got new plants moving in, okay? Or, or basically plants replacing each other in succession. Yes? Wouldn't a forest fire be secondary yeah, succession? 
In this case, that's where, um, like yes, yes, it is secondary. No. Primary good has never been soil before. Right. Exactly. So the, the, the better example here would be uh, exactly uh, glaciers retreating, and now the soil is, is you know, exposed and the first plants to move in, or volcanic eruption. So soil that has not harbored plants in the past. That's a good example. And fire would be, would be like tillage. It would be a secondary. The plants were there. There was a fire wiped out the current vegetation, but other vegetation moves in. Okay? So just be aware of that. Uh, what strategy do weeds tend to... Okay? A very large portion of agricultural weeds are competitive rules. We talked about that. Okay? Which weeds are best described as ruderals? Short-lived annuals. You know, very much as we, we had talked about. They are strategists. I mean, the two work together, right? The, the CSR built on RNK selection. So that's why you go, wow, I just heard that. You just showed that. Just to show. It expanded it to include three categories. Okay? Which are best described as competitors? Okay? Simple herbaceous perennials, which are best described as stress tolerators. You know, the guys that are in there for long, long term. Okay? And again, I'm not going to, you know, name that one weed, that's, but understand the concept. The bigger concept, okay? If you can give an example, great, but it's not going to make or break. It's more, to me, what's important is your understanding of the general theory, okay? So I think we had talked about that. Okay. Any questions on this section, okay? So would you be able, if on a prelim I ask you, what are, can you discuss, list and discuss several ways that weeds can be classified, what we call weeds can be classified. Can you go through that and provide me some examples, you know, what they are and generally how, how is that done? Please be able to do that, okay? I mean, it's not no trick question here. It's going to be, you know, your understanding of it, okay? So now what, that we're here, what I'd like to do, we've, we're, we've classed, now I want to start getting into the nitty-gritty stuff. Okay, you kind of have an idea of what weeds do now. Okay, I've got enough of that. Let's get into the ecology, biology of these things and what are some things I need to know. And we're going to start with the soil seed bank because that is so crucial to managing weeds. Remember I told you about becoming famous and winning a Nobel Prize? It all has to do with the seed bank. Figure out a way for these, these weeds not to, ger seeds not to germinate or have them all germinate at once. And you will get a Nobel I guarantee you you will get a Nobel Prize for figuring that out. So the challenge is out there. Nobody's figured it out yet. So um, this next section is Chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to pass it out. Please take a look at the readings for Ross and Lemby because it's, you know, it builds on what I say here. So if you get a chance, we do have two copies on reserve in the library if, if you don't have a, a copy of, on your own, which, as I mentioned, is not a requirement. Okay? Uh, let me just... Go here, chapter three. Okay. So, does anybody know what this plant is? And the reason I put it out because it's got a lot of seeds in the seed bank. Is that, uh, mare's, tail? mare's tail. What? What is that? Any other name, scientific or common? Horseweed. Horseweed. Anybody know the scientific name? Kaniza canadensis. Now, nah, Eric knows this stuff because he's had to do it for his, uh, you know, field work and stuff. So don't be thinking, geez, am I lost in this place? You're all going to be able to get this guy. Major problem in particularly no-till corn and beans, it is now we have major league resistance to Roundup. So this has become a major Roundup-ready issue in Maryland, Pennsylvania. It is moving it to New York State. You get this on there, Roundup is not going to touch it. You get these resistance, and we'll talk more about it. But this is mare's tail. Uh, Kaniza canadensis, also referred to as horse tail for some folks. And it's these little plants, and you'll be seeing it, okay? And there's the rosette, okay? It can be a summer annual, winter annual, okay? So I actually have some of this. The rosette is in my garden. My I went out the other night, and I'm looking, and it's setting itself up. It's not going to set, set flowers... So you can see it's behaving as a winter annual. It germinated probably in July or August. It is now about that size. It's, gonna, it's not going to go anywhere. It's going to sit there. Uh, and next spring, before I even get into, you know, in May to do something, it'll probably already upset seed. Okay? That's what it looks like. 
This is bad news. It can get up to this high, and so mare's tail, horse tail, because it kind of really looks like a horse. The uh, flowers are very tiny. They, they look like little asters. You know, made in tiny dandelions, but they're white. Okay? That's what they look like. Thousands of seeds. Uh, think of miniature uh, milkweed seeds flying many, many miles. And that's why this plant is so problematic. And people are not just worried in your own field. This is where you need to, and some of my colleagues at Penn State are working on what's called a regional weed management program, where basically they have to get buy-in from all the growers in the area, in, in, in uh, you know, southeastern uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland and Delaware, for this thing to work. Because if you've got a couple of farmers or growers that are not interested in this, and, and the plant is seeding, it is being carried by wind, very, I mean, I think the, you know, it's at least 100 kilometers, okay, 60 miles, easily. Does anybody know Elson Shields, Professor Elson Shields from entomology? Has anybody worked up at Aurora, the research station at Aurora? Did you ever hear, see these little model airplanes flying? Now, Elson Shields is a professor of entomology over at Comstock, and one of his hobbies is flying model airplanes. What's neat about what he does is that he also samples for pollen, and was involved in a project to sample the, you know, higher levels that, you know, where, where you get basically some wind currents with these airplanes. They have special traps on them that actually will collect, in this case, horseweed seed, okay, flying in the air because they have the little coma at the back, you know, the little parachute, and these things can be carried. And that's how they determined how far they went. And they also did some wind tunnel work. And this is a former uh, technician in my lab that finished his PhD at Penn State did that. His name is Joe Dower. And, and if any of you are interested in seeing how far these things go, I can point you to their, you know, their published work. But basically, this plant is going to be a major league issue for us here in terms of we better be thinking about something beyond Roundup, okay? Because it's, it's, and it's coming. So what I was saying is, you know, through that work, it was determined you can't just have a couple of growers working in isolation. You've got to get the whole region if you want to control this thing. And they're doing that exactly for any of you who are working or from the Midwest or know about Midwestern. Um, there's something called uh, water hemp. How many of you have heard of, of weed called water hemp? Okay, amaranthus. It's in the pigweed family, rutus. Number one weed in kind of Illinois, Indiana, resistant population. They now have found a resistant population, okay, that they're trying to quarantine. Make sure it doesn't get out. And, and I was just speaking to a couple of colleagues in the Midwest that are, you know, how do you do that? And that they need to get buy-in from the rest of the, you know, not just from that pub, the rest of the growers to be monitoring. Because if they don't, this population is going gonna, is gonna to explode. And it's a bad, bad weed, if any of you have heard about that. Yes, Emily? Wouldn't it be good to have populations that aren't all being treated the same? That way, by spreading that gene intervening, it would prevent one particular area from getting resistance. Right. And we'll talk about that. We'll have a lab on resistance, but you're absolutely right. So the question here is, well, that's the problem, of course. Whenever you do any tactic, and this goes in your personal lives, I've told you, all you think about is Cornell and, and work and work and work, you know, makes some of you not happy folks. You need some diversity. You need diversity of of uh, management tactics. It doesn't matter if it's an insecticide, nematicide, fungicide, use the same product over and over again, you're guaranteed, you're guaranteed to have this kind of situation. And that's what's happened, okay? Some of these growers have been spraying Roundup Ready since it first became available in their fields, okay? And they've got corn, they've got beans, and they've got alfalfa that's Roundup Ready. And they, they, wheat was on the market, was about to come out in Monsanto because of public pressure they pulled it off the shelf saying, I mean, and from scientists, we scientists say, this is insane. You're, you're going to, you know, if and you're going to have grown, you can't blame the growers because it is much cheaper, but you're not thinking long-term sustainability for the farmer. And farmers looking at paying the bills. So that, that's an issue, but you're absolutely right. And we'll talk about that. What are some of the ways that you could mitigate? And we'll talk about that, you know, but I'm setting up the, the problem here. So what we're going to focus in this, you know, this section is, the seed pool. So what happens if weeds produce the seeds and many, and it's hundreds of thousands in many cases, and they land in the seed bank? What happens here? These guys just hang there? Do they die? Who, what determines who comes up, who doesn't? What are the numbers like if I go in and sample? Um, does anybody have any idea without going through the notes what might happen? What, what happens in that soil? Steve. 
Just throw out ideas. What, what, even without me telling you, what, what do you think is going on in there? It's moist, and the moisture goes through the seed coat, which gets to the tissue inside. And that, what does that do? It softens it up and allows it to, to germinate? germinate. Okay, so some conditions in soil that might do that. Some seeds go dormant, and they won't um, germinate. They'll start to hang top, and maybe like if you just spend temperature below or above. Okay, we'll talk about that. So... You know, cues to germination, dormancy. These are all going to be key things we're going to have to talk about. What else? Some die of old age. Old age. Some die from what else? Predators. Sorry? Predators. Predators. Fungi, disease. Okay. Uh, what about number-wise? Do you think if you go in an ag field, what are we talking about? Throw some numbers out. I don't know if you want to put on a metric basis or per, you know, per hectare. I don't want you to say it per acre because it's going to be scary. Uh, usually we're talking about 6 inches, 15 centimeter depth. That's kind of our typical sampling. Do you think there will be a relationship between uh, depth and ability to emerge? Yeah. And um, what, what is that going to be related to? Why is that important that, that you're, you know, Okay. And that's true. The, the larger the seed, the resource, the further down you could be and still be able to make it up. Why do most seeds have to be close to the soil surface? I'm not saying, you know, they're usually, I'll give you this. Most ag weed, you know, annual wheat seeds are within the first two inches from the, the, you know, from the, from the ground. So they're in there, five centimeters. Five centimeters, usually even two and a half first inch. If I go, I'll get most of my weed seeds, and, uh, and we'll talk about that, depending, of course, on what you do. If you're mobile plowing and everything is going to go down 8 inches or 12 inches a foot, but generally speaking, they're going to be in that top layer. Okay? Okay, so, but why are they close? Why should they be close? Because they're small, they don't have any nutrients. Okay, and, well, yeah, they're, and, but what else? And I'm trying to, sorry? There, there are going to be some specific environmental cues that for certain species tells them they are close and they're going to germinate and they're going to make it out. You don't want to be six inches in the ground, germinate, and you don't have any resources because you're a small seed. So, and we'll talk about that, okay? And so the reason why that's important is your management strategy might exacerbate the problem, get more things to come up when you don't want them to, okay? And, and knowing this, that's one reason why what do we, anybody here for in, in vegetable crop production, we do this a lot, stale seed bed. What's that? So, I mean, there's a lot of different, you, you're trying to just disturb the top layer of the soil so that you get the weeds that are going to be a problem later to emerge when you're not doing anything. In the right. So I'm going to go in my weed garden. I know there's going to be weed seeds, and I'm thinking, man, I've got to draw down that population. So the stale seed bed, and we'll talk more about it, um, method at least of trying to you know reduce weed pressure is where you basically go in and simulate you know at very you know low well in this case you know maybe at a depth of uh, you know a couple of inches you stir up the soil you and you're kind of faking that you're going to be planting the crop you simulate planting the crop but you're not going to plant it and usually you do that maybe a, you know a week before you were going to plant the crop anyway just to what that does is stimulates allows certain environmental cues light you know temperatures and so forth, to stimulate those seeds to germinate. They germinate, you wait a week, say, then you either go through with another cultivator, knock them off. Now remember, you haven't planted the crop. You've just gone in and stirred it. You kind of have, you know, just raked it up a little, just stirred, and that brings in oxygen, brings in light. Weeds are thinking, whoa, this is, I need to get out there. But what you're doing is you're going to take care of them before you plant your crop. So you're going to draw down the population, you know, at these steps. You're not going to do it. You're not going to stir everything up because that is a major problem. You want to just at least clean out, okay, sanitize the, the, the top. And you're not going to get all of them, but you're going to get a fair number of them. And then you could go with a you know, herbicide or, or you could go with a cultivator or a flame weeder and knock them off. And I'll show you a video in lab 
um, with some vegetable growers using flame weeders and some of the equipment they, they do. And they'll, the first thing they'll tell you is, oh, yeah, we don't want to go too deep. We just want to, you know, basically cultivate very shallowly, a shallow level, enough to get our, our, you know, not bring up other weed seeds. And that's going to be an important concept that we'll cover. But you have basically have hit it on the nail in terms of what is it going to take for these plants, these seeds to germinate? What's the, this whole thing of dormancy? What does that mean? How, do, how does a seed, are they all dormant when they come off the plant? Or do they become dormant? What, hap, I mean, what is this thing? And how long can they stay in that soil without germinating? And, you know, will they die? So this is the focus. Remember, this is Harper. John Harper was a plant ecologist, okay? Very famous plant e population ecologist. And he basically viewed plants this kind of life cycle. So we're focusing right here, called the, the seed bank or the seed pool, okay? Remember, this is so important because this is many of our weed species, our most problematic plants are annuals. Biannuals and simpler bits, seed is the only link between generations. So if you knock this back, you're going to be ahead of the game. We haven't been able to do it yet. But understanding that this is the only link is, is, is important. Remember that, that, that person I told you from Rochester that had the brew cucumber? I mean, the fact that I, you know, you kind of know, hey, that's an annual. Just don't let them go to seed. It was, he certainly didn't have any seeds there before, so it's whatever he brought in. And I said, just monitor your, your mulch in the coming years, but make sure these plants don't go to seed because we knew that's an annual. If I knew this was a perennial, he had field bindweed or something, well, now it's a little more complicated. You've got these rhizomes and so forth, okay? But this is important. Know the enemy, the biology. Okay? So I won't cover all this, but this is what I'm trying to, to get to. What is the active population? What is the passive seed bank population? I'm not talking about above ground. What's the difference between weed control and weed management? Okay? Seed longevity. How long are these things lasting? I'll give you some numbers. It'll be scary. You'll think, man, I mean, are we ever going to be able to do something here? But I think we can. What are some models? There isn't one seed dormancy. I mean, the end result is that seeds are dormant, but there are various dormancies, categories, that I want to just present to you. And then, what allows a seed to germinate and emerge? Does anybody know what the difference between germination and emergence is? What's the difference? If I say, that'll be a question on the prelim. What's germination and emergence? What's the difference? Okay, so that's often, a lot of folks usually confuse the two when they really mean, if, if I'm monitoring what's coming out of the soil, you shouldn't be calling that, oh, I'm looking at seedling or seed germination. Because something could have germinated in the soil, i.e. the embryo has come out of the seed coat and you've got the radical, you know, which is the precursor to roots, and the hypocotyl, you know, the kind of typically, and it could die in the you know, basically the, the seed could have germinated and the, the plant never made it, never come through, as Steve said, through the soil surface, i.e. emerge. So when you're monitoring a quadrat and you're seeing things come up, you're really looking at emergence. You're not measuring germination. Do not use that term. Unless you've got a Petri dish and you put seeds in and you can actually visually see the seeds. That's more of percent germination, okay? So it's might sound simple, but I mean, I actually even, you know, when I review manuscripts for scientific papers, it's amazing sometimes that I know the authors usually know the difference, but it's amazing how it slips in our language, and they, you know, they're really meaning emergence, and they're saying germination, I'm like, no way, don't do that, okay? So, uh, so the above ground plants that are visible in the field, that's the active plant population, okay? So, I want to basically tell you about this passive population. That's the population, say, of, uh, so let's say we're looking at ragweed. You can look above ground and say, wow, there, look at all the ragweed plants. That's the active population. You're seeing them. You're seeing the plants. Oh, man. But what you don't see is what's below ground, okay? Remember, I mean, you think the example for, you know, it's like icebergs. It's the tip of the iceberg. What's above, you should see what's below the water. This is the same for seed. If you think you have a lot of Seedlings in a field, very often there are direct, there's a direct link of what you see, okay, 
uh, with what's in the ground. But those, those seeds for those ragweed seeds in the population in the soil are referred to as the passive population. They're there, but they're not active yet that you're seeing them. They're not dead. Okay, that's the other thing. Seeds are not dead. They're quiescent. Okay? In fact, seeds are very, even dormant seeds are extremely alive because they're constantly trying to feel out what the environment is. So don't ever get the idea, oh, they're sitting there just kind of gone and then all of a sudden they wake up. No, no, they're constantly, they're not germinating, they're not actively, um, you know, germinating, but, the, but they're basically sensing the environment. Yes? Uh, the rhizomes in, uh, in this case, uh, below ground, no. They would still be a passive population until they come on up. So this isn't referred, referring just to seeds. We're going to focus on seeds now. Next class, we'll go into vegetative reproduction. But uh, rhizomes, stolons, I mean, they're visible. But they would, the rhizomes would be definitely passive because you wouldn't see them until you get the tillers coming out. That then would be the active population. Okay? So think about below ground Vegetative structures are, you know, equivalent to seeds, except they're vegetative, okay? The soil seed bank is the passive population. It acts as a buffer, resisting dramatic change in distribution and abundance of the total weed population, okay? If I sample some of your fields back home in your farms, and I, if I would be able to talk to each of those seeds and tell them what year did you come in there, you could have some plants say, hey, I made it in there in 1993. I made it there in 1998. Most are going to be in 2008, 2007, 2006, okay? But what I'm getting at is that they're a buffer, okay? They resist changes in this. Even though you wipe out a population above ground by using a herbicide, okay, you have below ground relatives, cohorts from that, that year, okay? So just because you wipe out the above ground, unless you're so good that you don't allow anything to go into the seed bank, which I have not seen anybody ever do, you're going to have individuals from these many different years in there. And that could be both a good or a bad thing. Can you tell me what would be a positive thing about having weeds, okay, weed seeds that could be from five years back, ten years back for a given weed? And what could be a bad thing? from a management perspective. That's important. If you catch on to this, you're going to start thinking like a, a weed management, or a weed manager, I should say. Go ahead, Annie. Um, with having um, many different age sensitive populations, the passive population, you're less likely to create a resistant population because you still have um, a wide variety of selection. You know what? If you had resistance, let's say, to Roundup, let's say it's ragweed. Yeah, okay, and but the the resistance only occurred started. You started seeing it, you know, five years ago. Okay, what that means is because you have a buffer, you've got a lot of seeds. Maybe prior to when resistance developed, you have a lot of susceptible species in there. That might be an advantage. Okay, that might some of those might be better competitors against the resistant biotypes. Okay, and we'll try to maximize that. So i.e. there's more genetic diversity in there and that could be helpful, particularly for resistance issues, okay? i.e. your seed bank is not 100% made up of resistant seeds of that Roundup population, unless it's been 20 years and these seeds just keep going in. Over time, you're going to have 90% are going to be resistant. But early on, because of this buffering capacity and the fact that some of these seeds can survive a number of years, you've got a mix in the population of some resistant by, you know, seeds that have come in or, you know, recently, but some older seeds that are, are there from previous generations. Okay? So that might be a good thing. A bad thing could be what? Could, could there be kind of, what, what is the negative of having this buffer? Yeah, the bank. yeah. these populations, they're not only are they diverse, okay? It's like a genetic pool for, the, for you know, in their seeds, right? Sexual reproduction. It's a genetic pool, and it's going to take you many years to draw down that seed bank. And that's why I keep telling you, remember those numbers I put up, why weed control is, you know, 70% of, uh, you know, is, is in, in control, not in losses, because you know you're going to have these weeds because of that seed bank replenishes. 
And so, and again, if you miss one plant, you're at, you've got 200,000 seeds. And then we get in with our plows. And what do we do with our plows and cultivation equipment? Move the seeds around. Spread them around. So, guess what? Even if you had it in one area, you now have moved it throughout the field. Okay? Okay? And this is... This whole idea that pests or diseases tend to be out of occasional frequent pests, weeds are a constant. And you've got to keep that in mind. It's, it's uh, as I call it, you know, the chronic, the cancer. It's there. It's always going to be there. You're not going to say, Phew. you know, some years, and if you do a good job, maybe it won't be as severe. But it's not going to be, uh, like I told you, well, this year I think I'll step back and um, I don't need Roundup. Or I don't need, you know, Bazagran or Prowl or any of those. Or I, I don't need to cultivate. How many organic growers do I know are going to say, oh, I don't think I need to cultivate it. Just rotation is going to do it. It's not going to do it. In fact, cultivation you know, might need more of it. Okay? So uh, this is just basically dealing with the seed bank is going to be a key management strategy. And this is where I want you to start thinking about your own fields, your own situations. And when you leave Cornell and you're dealing with whether it's natural system agricultural systems, understanding the seed bank is going to be critical. For those of you interested in natural areas management, when I was involved with the Nature Conservancy trying to manage swallowwort, this invasive mine, the reason I got involved in the project was that the Nature Conservancy people were trying to restore a habitat where they had tried to remove the swallowwort. Okay? It's a perennial that reproduces mostly by seed. And they went in there and transplanted or tried to plant some native species. It failed miserably. And one of the questions that our first question when I was asked, you know, can you help us? I said, have you looked at the seed bank? Do you know how long? Because basically the swallowers is popping left and right. And they said, oh, we thought they weren't going to be there, you know, and the, and the natives were going to outcompete. And I said, man, you, you need to figure. We, I didn't know how long the seeds lasted, how many seeds were produced. First thing we did, we sampled the seed bank, went in just like you do with soil scores, with cores, germinated them, used the hydraulic system to separate the, the seeds, and then we, we looked at how long, what's the longevity of these, of these seeds? How long can they last? Because that will inform you on, boy, I need to you know, control this for two years, three years. The nice thing is it's not too long. It's between three and five years, which isn't bad when you think about ag fields and ag weeds that could be 30 years. The other thing to keep in mind, and I'll keep harping on this, don't get the idea that 50% of velvet leaf seeds or lamb squatters are going to survive 40 years. It's a very small percentage. 0.1% might make it to 20 years or 30 years under the ideal condition. But 0.1% of 200,000 is quite a few seeds. Okay? But if somebody says, oh, they survived 40 years, and you kind of get the impression, wow, everything, everything that goes in there is wrong. Most of them will germinate within the first couple of years under the right conditions, unless you bury them and then you bring them back up. And we'll talk about how tillage can really cause you problems. Okay? And so... What I'm getting at here is the seed bank is a major difference between integrated weed management and some of the other pest management situations. It's not that the you know, insects and, and diseases don't have seed, you know, seed pools or spore pools and so forth, but for weeds it's very, very distinct. We don't have equivalents. You know, we do have some insects that are going to diapause, the kind of equivalent that you have to wait how long is it, are they going to be coming out, and same for for spores, sclerotia, for some of you are familiar with uh, diseases like sclerotinia, okay? But it's nowhere near the degree of weeds, and that's why they're kind of unique on their own little, okay? So let me just finish off with this general, um, a few general statements. The seed bank population is much larger, significantly, sometimes by a factor of 10, larger than the above ground population. So what you're seeing above is just Truly, the tip of the iceberg. So if I go and I see velvet leaf galore in a, in a grower's field, oh, man, I, in my mind, especially I know that velvet leaf has longevity, you know, hard seed coat, very, you know, dormant. That's a problem. Many wheat seeds produce seed that is capable of surviving the soil for many years. That is true. Okay? Most species. Generally speaking, grasses, grass seeds tend to be uh, not as long-lived as dicot seeds. Okay, so when I'm dealing with grasses, because they're just more tender, okay, they don't have the hard seed coat in general, they don't last as long. So this is a generality, you know, just, just keep that in mind. 
And that's what I was referring to. Although some seeds may persist for many years, the size of the soil seed bank normally declines, okay, considerably after each year. That's why there's still hope of us getting in there and, and, and slowing it down. When we run into problems is when we're digging things and we have, you know, seeds lying on the seed, seed, you know, on the ground. We plow under. The next year we go back and mow board plow, bring those from the bottom up. They haven't died. That's the thing that people forget. Now, if you'd leave them there for 10 years, yeah, it's probably not a bad thing. They're a foot and a half on, in the ground. But most, you know, in conventional till, you're going back the next year and you're mow board plowing. And we'll talk about reduced tillage as a way to manage weeds, not just for soil, okay, for soil conservation and soil erosion conservation. So in no-till, we're not going to disturb the soil. So what are we going to do? We're not going to be bringing seeds from the top. What are we going to do at the top? We're still going to, you know, we're going to kind of scrape the top, okay? So the seeds that are going to be germinating at the top, we're going to be needing to control them. Okay, so do you guys think, and this is what I'll leave you with, in no-till system or reduced-till systems, do we have a greater dependence on herbicide or less, lesser dependence on herbicides relative to conventional tillage where we either chisel or more bold plow, mold board plowing? So do we, need herb do we use more herbicides in no-till or reduced till than we do in conventional? What do you guys think? Because that's a, often a misconception because people equate uh, soil, uh, erosion control, you know, it's really good, soil conservation, no-till, reduced till, and certainly for weeds. But when you tell them, in fact, we use, we have to depend on more herbicides. Why? Because we don't cultivate. We can't cultivate to control the weeds. So how are we going to do it? You're going to do it by using herbicides. We, there's other strategies, but generally speaking, and this is always surprising to folks because, wow, herbicides, soil conservation. I mean, the two don't seem to, and in fact, it's Roundup, you know, without Roundup coming out that allowed no-till to be practiced in the first place because we had a herbicide that could control early on, could, and in, in, in uh, Roundup-ready soybeans, we could do no-till because we could go in with Roundup and clean out the weeds without killing the crop. So... Just keep that in mind. No-till wouldn't have been around if we didn't have some of these herbicides, particularly Roundup. Yes, Emily? It kind of depends, though, because um, I know in the tropical cropping system, you can have quite a few in the article where in uh, somewhere in South East Asia, they started doing no-till, and that actually was really good because the weed population that was there was, um, it had been, like, it favored tilling, so when they started doing no-till, there were people that used to it, and actually had less weeds. Yeah. Long-term no-till and practice properly, it's actually, and we'll talk about it. It'll actually, that's what I said. It will draw down the seed bank because if you're able to not allow seeds or the seed rain to keep dropping, you're going to be exhausting that two-inch, you know, because you're still going to disturb the soil, at least where you're going to be putting your crop in. If you're, you know, drilling in your beans or so forth, you're going to make some disturbance, but you will also try to minimize Disturbance. You don't want to invert the soil like you do with mold bore plowing, okay? But eventually, if you're really good at not allowing weeds to go to seed, okay, you absolutely you will draw down. So, it's, but what I'm saying is, early on, you might need to, you know, use some some herbicides. But eventually, but you know, this is that's why it is a challenge for organic growers to do no-till in 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 a kind of annual crop. It's it's practiced, but it's a challenge, okay? Yes, Megan. Right. So it's more of an intercropping system that they're having to look into. But, but that's what they're, you know, the ideal would be there. You're still trying to conserve soil, okay, and fertility, but also how do you suppress the weeds if cultivation isn't going to be a big part of it? And so, right, the Rodale with the roller crimper, which basically flattens out, you know, and, and provides a bit of cover and suppressiveness. There are ways you could do it, and it's, it's being looked at. But I just, it often was a misconception when you would say, I need to use more herbicides in general, in no-till, wow, you know, in terms of soil conservation. And I'm just saying, we're moving away from that because we recognize, but don't underestimate the value of herbicides in those systems. It's just not in, in conservation. Okay? Yes, Bob.